it's good to be with you this evening. Amen. How many are ready to have something imparted in you that's going to be permanent that will change your life? Amen. You know, I spent about six hours today in my hotel room before the Lord, praying, meditating, getting this word. And make sure that you're recording it, okay? And what I saw, I just kept seeing young people. I just kept seeing young people coming to this ministry. And I saw older people that were like receiving them. They were like parents. But I saw a river of young people. And I heard the Lord say, I'm going to take a generation of young people. I'm going to train them. I'm going to impart to them, not just to be preachers, but to be business owners, to be workers that are skilled, to be professional people. And he says, I'm going to use these people to shift and shake a portion of your region. And I saw some of them going far beyond this. And let me tell you, I've been, say, 50 years, 50 some years, I've been in about seven or eight major moves of God in different places on the earth. And one of the things that I can discern is when God wants to blow in a place. And I don't like to use the word revival. Revival means to make alive what was dead. I think there's something greater than that that God wants to do. I think he wants to call a generation who don't understand their purpose, that they're surrounded by confusion, disorder, Iniquity, the word iniquity means to be bent so bad it no longer has the original shape. You have that when you have men and women sports and just all the mess that's inside of the culture that we live in right now. And I just felt like these two nights are something that these young people need to take it and meditate it and pass it on to some other young people. I really wish I would have had this teaching when I was 19, 20, 21, because this is a permanent teaching. It's going to change your life. My wife could not be here. Her name is Karen. Just say, come to Minnesota, Karen. Come to Minnesota, Karen. And she wanted to tell you that she's the good Karen. All right. <laughs> Tonight, we're continuing our message on building a Christian brain. Building a Christian brain. Can I get a cup of some sugar? A cup or a coffee cup or something? <clears throat> One of the things that has been neglected in not just charismatic Pentecostal circles, but just all circles, it seems like the church people are living off of inspiration, motivation preaching, declaration preaching, proclamation preaching. You can have, you can be, you can hold, and that's not bad. That's like the starting gun for a race. But God wants you to develop the capacity to know him. And you can't know him unless you have a Christian brain. Look at you and say, I really want a Christian brain. Come on, say, I really want a Christian brain. That's a brain that can connect with God, that knows God, all right? Now, I'm going to be repeating some things so I can connect, but they're worth hearing again. Everybody say, repetition, repetition. Is, the is the mother of all learning. Of all learning. Humans have an unlimited capacity to learn, to know, to grow. Unlimited. Those that research these things, that the average person only uses a fraction of their brain maybe 10%, maybe less. And it's because it's not something that is directed. Give me one second right here. Just put it in a small one. Yeah, put it in a small one because it'll just pour it in a small one. It'll set up here better. Okay. You can put it over there. <clears throat> That humans have an unlimited capacity to learn and to know. And 
we don't know everything there is to know about spirit and soul. But there's something dynamic between the spirit and the soul that's going to be eternal. There's a part of it that's going to be eternal. I don't really understand it. Nobody on this side of heaven does. But we have an unlimited capacity to learn because you have an eternal spirit right now. Say, I have an eternal spirit. And I think part of our limitation is our flesh living in a finite world. But we are going to have an unlimited ability to learn for eternity. You have an eternal spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, I'm going to be reading scriptures. I encourage you to write them down and go look them for yourself. It says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. The word edification is to build. It means to create. And literally, this is not a joke, it's not a play on words. If you knew the Greek language, Really, the word renewing your mind is rebuilding your mind or remodeling your mind. God wants you to have a Christian mind. He wants you to have a Christian brain. And many people diminish understanding the brain as far as walking with God. They think, well, it's all a spirit. No, no, no. The Bible says in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, it says, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, God does everything by prophetic promise. You know why? Because that makes it fair and equal for everybody. Everybody can receive a promise, the poor, the rich. And when you grab that promise, he expects you to have faith by spending time with God. But guess what? Say this, say, every promise, every promise that God gives, God gives needs, a brain. needs a brain. Every prophetic promise, every prophetic promise needs, a brain. needs a brain. Because when God sends his life through you, it's got to be interpreted with a brain. God would not have given you a mind or a brain unless it was essential for what God had. Listen to me. I've had people for years say, when they see me minister, they say, Prophet Kevin, can you lay hands on me for your anointing? And I said, that's going to be a no. No, you can't have my anointing. you got to have my wife, my life, my devils, all my past, all my failures, all my successes. But the real reason you can't have my anointing it's because you can't have my mind. Wow. See, if you don't have a mind with a memory, the anointing doesn't work. I'm going to prove it to you. When David saw Goliath, what happened to him? In his mind, where his memory was, he went backwards and he began to declare to Goliath what was in his brain, what was in his memory. He said, Goliath, there was a time in my father's field. Now, he was only 14. I think that Goliath came shortly after he was anointed because he was 14 when he met Goliath. And he said, Goliath, he said, when I was in my father's field, a lion came and grabbed a lamb. And I chased that lion down. And I pulled the lion's mouth, I saved the lamb, and I killed the lion. Then he said, there was a time when a bear came, and I killed the bear. That's all in his memory. And then he says, Goliath, you're next. Let me tell you something. The way my anointing works is part new, part old. I walk into a place, and God will do to me what he, did to, what he did to David. I'll remember that time in Spain, do the same thing here. The time in France, do the same thing here. The time in Brazil, do the same thing here. And then I'll get new stuff. 
that I never saw before. So all ministry is a combination of the new and the old. But it's in your mind. It's in your memory. I said, if I ever lose my memory, I'll lose my anointing. If I ever lose my memory, I'll lose my anointing. Because I can't have the Lord bring to my remembrance the things that he used me before so I can use them again and go beyond and greater. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? So every prophetic promise needs a brain. I'm convinced many people get accurate, real prophetic words, but they never get a Christian brain. And they just feel God's presence. Like we said last night, the presence and the anointing are different. The presence is for fellowship. The anointing is for work. I want to give you some scriptures here because I believe I got some young people here. You can make the difference. Do you know that John the apostle was 17 when Jesus called him? He's a teenager. That's why he lived so long. Peter was probably in his late 20s or early 30s, but John was a teenager. Timothy was a teenager when God called him. Teenagers, he's calling you. You're not too young to make a difference if you get a Christian brain. But your generation is brainwave dead. They're just, they got a TikTok brains. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, do you have a TikTok brain? Do you have an Instagram brain? God, I want to be used, but you got a TikTok brain. You spend more time on TikTok than you do in the Word of God. Everybody go tick, tock, tick, tock. Come on, one, two, three. Time is up. Get a brain. Time is up. Get a brain. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved of God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So there's a right way and a wrong way to divide the word. There's some crazy beliefs in the church today. I mean, just ding-dong, crazy beliefs. You can't substantiate it. I think, I feel, I, you know, I had a flying cheeseburger that gave me a word from the Lord. Hey, hey, please. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2, 15, in the Amplified, it says, study and be eager to do your utmost to present yourself to God, approved, tested by trial. Somebody say, tested by trial. <laughs> Let me just say this. I'm going to come back to the scripture. How many want to be like Jesus? I mean, if you want to be like Jesus, make some crazy noise in his place. All right, now listen. You're going to get everything Jesus got. You're going to get a Judas. You get to have your own personal Judas kiss. You get a Peter. Somebody that's got more zeal than wisdom. You get a Thomas. I don't think I believe you. I don't think I believe you. I don't think I believe you. <laughs> you get a John, young, loving, and wants to be on your team. You get your own personal fight with the devil. You get your, listen to me, you get your own wilderness. The Bible said that when Jesus was baptized, he was immediately led to a wilderness. This is the devil. I bind you, devil. I bind you. I bind. Hey, hey, hey. Maybe that was a wilderness that God led you into to prove you, to reveal something to you, to separate you for a season from your TikTok friend so he could visit you. 
from Brother Ding Dong and Sister Dingaling so that you could find God. <laughs> Study to show yourself eager to do your utmost to present yourself to God, attested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing, accurately dividing, rightly handling, skillfully teaching the word of truth. I'm going to say that again. You cannot do this without a brain. You cannot fulfill the scripture without a kingdom brain. A workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing, accurately dividing, rightly handling, skillfully teaching the word of truth. Somebody say, Lord, build me a ministry brain. If you're going to be doing some ministry for Jesus, raise your hands. I want to see who I got here. If you're a disciple, raise your hands. That means you've forsaken all, carrying your cross, and you're ready to walk with Jesus. Just say, Holy Spirit, build me a ministry brain so I can work with you in ministry. So I can recognize when you do ministry through me. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 says this. Let no one despise your youth. I feel like God gave me this scripture for this time right now. Let no one despise your youth. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Till I come, give attention to the reading and exhortation and doctrine. Then it says, do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given by prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands of the leaders or the elders or the pastors around you. Then it says, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to your gift that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and the doctrine. Continue in them for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear. Look at verse 15 again. Meditate on these things. You can't meditate without a mind. You have to have a brain, a ministry brain to meditate. But look what it says. Meditate and give yourself entirely to them. You know what I find with a lot of people that they're halfway wanting ministry. Years ago, God says, son, I'm going to use you but you got to give yourself to your gift. You got to surrender yourself to the gift I gave you. You got to treat that gift like it's your very life. Whether people celebrate you, whether they denigrate you, whether you have a big door, you have a little door. Treat that gift like it's your life because it is. He said, give yourself. I feel the Holy Ghost in here right now. Because a lot of you have treated your gift as a hobby. It's a part-time venture. But if you say, God, man, I feel in this place. The eyes of the Holy Ghost are watching in this room say, Father, Father tonight, I tonight I make a decision to give all of myself to the gift you gave me. I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to dedicate myself to it. I'm going to get a ministry brain so I can recognize you when you come upon me to use that gift. Man, I feel this thing in this room. Meditation is a lost, a lost thing in the church. You know what you can't have in most services is silence. If it's more than a minute of silence, people start getting nervous. Let's just try it for a second. Somebody got a, got a minute hand on their watch? You got one? We're going to sit here for a silent for a minute. Let me know. One, two, three.
That was one minute. You know why it's important to be in silence? He said, be still and know I am God. It takes some solitude to build a brain. It takes being apart to build a brain. It takes being in his, man, I feel the spirit of God jumping up and down saying, Oh, yeah, I'm about to have a disciple with a brain. Oh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm about to have a partner with a brain. Can you imagine how frustrated the Holy Ghost is inside of you if you don't have a brain? All you have is feelings. How you feel? How you feel? How you feel? What do you think? Don't have a brain, can't think. What do you discern? Don't have a brain, can't discern. But I feel. I'm a feeling Christian. When thinkers become feelers, they become powerful. When feelers become thinkers, they become powerful. Because God is a feeler and a thinker. Let me ask you a question. I, I've used this question a couple of times since last week. How many got Jesus? How many got a full grown Jesus inside of you? I want to ask you a question. Is the Jesus in you bored being inside of you? Is Jesus bored being inside of you? He said, I came to do the will of my father. And if you're not doing it, he's bored. Is Jesus bored being inside of you? I think a lot of people, he's bored in this room. He's mainly on a rescue mission. To keep you out of trouble. The word meditate means to revolve in the mind. To turn it over and over or just keep thinking about it. It means to imagine. It means to see like a screen, like an imagination. You know what happens many times I'll be in a church, I'll be praying for a service. And I'll see this, uh, it'll be like eight or nine hours before the service. And I'll have a, my mind will have like a TV screen. And I'll see the meeting before the meeting. And when I come to the church, oh, I've been here before. I've seen him before. And I just kind of wait till it kicks in. And then, oh, this is the part where the God showed me. And I begin to call stuff out. But you got to have a brain. Come on, somebody say, Lord, give me a kingdom brain. God, give me a Christian brain. It means to meditate means to practice in your mind, to ponder the path or the ways of God. It means to invent it in your mind like you see it being constructed. Your mind is usually underserved and underused by most Christians because you never get in silence. You never set apart. You never say, I'm going to meditate. Now, here's what happens, when you, and I have scripture to show you if we get to it. While you're meditating on it, guess what happened? God drops his thoughts in your thoughts. Has anybody ever had a thought that you know it came from God? Many times, many times, the way you know it came from Am I okay? All right. Many times... The way you know a thought came from God is a word you never use. Now, you know the word, but it's not a part of your daily language. And all of a sudden, you hear this word, you're like, that wasn't my word. That was God dropping a word on me. Or you'll get a picture, or you'll get an image, or you'll have a conclusion about something. And all of a sudden, you know that that's God dropped it in your head. Remember when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? 
And Peter says, you're the Messiah. What did Jesus say? Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven. That is a picture of the Christian life. That's how it's supposed to work all the time. Let me just say this. One of the big problems with modern Christians is that, that they have dualism. Somebody say dualism. The word dualism came from the Greek philosophers which separated your spirit and your body. And they said, basically they said your flesh man, your body was animalistic and that servile work was like an animal and that you had to live for the higher realm, which is the spirit and philosophizing and stuff. And Aristotle influenced some of the early church fathers, Augustine, some of those guys. And they wrote with a dualistic purpose. You hear many people say, you hear many people say, I want to be in the full-time ministry. Let me ask you a question. How many here are full-time Christians? How many here, oh, you got to raise your hands right now. How many are full-time Christians? Well, you better be because you're fighting a full-time devil. The devil never takes a day off. And if you take a day off, the devil's waiting for it to take it so he can take you. Dualism says that they're sacred and they're secular. Like, okay, we're in a meeting, so we're in a sacred space now. Shababa, play the worship, wave our hands, do a little dance. Hey, we're in the holy place, we're in the sacred. But that's not how God sees it. That's not how the Hebrews saw it. They said all of life is sacred. Whether I'm working, whether I'm worshiping with song, all of it is sacred. Everybody say avoda. 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 That is the Hebrew word for work. But it also is the Hebrew word for serve. It's also the Hebrew word for worship. It's also the Hebrew word for serving. All of life is a voda. If I'm working a job, God says you're worshiping. If, I, if you're a nurse in a hospital providing services for people, God says that's worship. Why? You're restoring the earth. When he said, Adam, work in my garden. Keep it fresh. Keep it restored. When you are working, God says, you are the Adam where you are. The avoda is happening. The avoda. And see, I, I want to kill that sacred secular thing in here because it makes lazy Christians and you turn your Wi-Fi off. Well, I'm going to work now. I got to go to work. You know, just service is going to be in about seven hours. I got to go to work. No, no, no. If you, if you are, have a kingdom brain, if you are a spirit-filled Christian, your work is your worship. Somebody say, my work is my worship. Just make sure your work is honorable. It's something that Jesus would do. And there is no... There is no work that he would not do if he will wash the feet of disciples. And that was the lowest form because he was washing animal dung off of people's feet. He said, I'll be with you at the lowest job and the highest job. See, so here's why you got to realize that you have to be conscious of his presence all the time. Somebody say two for the price of one. <laughs> Come on, shout two for the price of one. One more time, louder. You see, if somebody hires you, they get two for the price of one because you get me and Jesus. I'm going to have words of wisdom, words of knowledge, revelation. Let me ask you a question. How many know the Old Testament? How many of you know the Old Testament patriarch named Joseph? Okay. What was Joseph's deal? 
Where, what was Joseph's main gift? He was a dreamer. What was his main gift? Huh? What was, what was Joseph's main gift? Nobody saying anything? Interpreting dreams? No. His main gift was administration. That was his gift. The dream was the doorknob on the door, but administration was the door he walked through. Everything that Joseph did that got him in trouble and got him blessed was administration. His brothers threw him in a pit because he was an administrator. Then he got into Potiphar's house as a slave, but it was administration that got him out into the prison. When he was in the prison, it was administration that made him a trustee. And then he interpreted that dream. He got brought before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, you know my dream. Who can I get to administrate the dream? And he got chosen for that. But if he had said, I'm, I'm only going to do it by myself, I'm not going to stay connected with God as I'm serving in administration. This is a Monday. I'm cleaning this. I'm cleaning that. I'm just a servant. I'm just a slave. But no, no, he said, I'm going to do this thing unto God. All of life is worship. All... I'm in this prison, but I'm worshiping. I'm a slave, but I'm worshiping. And God says, your worship is going to open doors for you in your serving. But you can't do this without a Christian brain. You got to have a Christian brain. Now listen to me very carefully. For some reason, the church has just lost this whole thing about development of your intellect and your brain. If you want to be a doctor, do you have, a, do you have to have a doctor brain? You can't just say, well, I just love people and I want to start cutting on them. I think I feel, you know, no, 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 no. Do you have to have a pilot brain to drive a jet airplane? Do you got to have an engineer brain to build a bridge? Well, why would you think you can get away with serving God without a brain? Well, we believe in revival. Then you better get a revival brain. I want to build a church. You better get a church building brain. Well, God told me to have a bit. You better get a business brain. Well, I have the anointing. Yeah, the anointing without a brain is going nowhere. And we got these foolish preachers. Well, God don't care if he didn't have an education. He didn't have this, he didn't have that. And he says, favor ain't fair. I'm the next in line. That may preach in a conference, but it don't live out in real life. You go up to a business and say, Man, I was in a hot Holy Ghost meeting last night. I declared the favor of God. He said, I, I got a word that I was next in line, so I'm here for a job. I want a job in your factory, man. I want a job in your office. And what are your qualifications? Let me put your brain on paper. Somebody say, put your brain on paper. It's called your resume. It takes more than I've been to a shouting church. I need to have a resume that shows me your brain. You cannot, listen, I'm going to get in this in a second. But brown and black people of which I am one. He said, what are you, Kevin? I had my ancestry.com done. So I'm going to let you know. I'm 40% African, 40% European, 20% Iberian Peninsula and 10% Swedish. So I, I'm one of y'all. I'm just not Chinese, but everything else I got covered. My family looks like a box of crayons when we take a picture. We got red heads, blondes, blue eyed, brown eyes. We got black, we got tan, pecan tan, paper sack brown. We got them all.
Are you ready? But this generation of Americans, especially if you go to one of these horrible Minnesota liberal universities, they tell you that you're a victim. You poor black woman, you're a victim. You Hispanic woman of color, you're a victim. You transgender person, you're a victim. How can you be a victim if Jesus is living inside of you? The Bible says that we always go in triumph. That's a lie. And so what happens if you think you're a victim, you don't have a chance. See, victimization is the first cousin to fatalism. There's no hope for me. Unless the white man helped me, unless the government helped me, uh, I, can't, I can't get no help. I, I'm a victim. I'm a victim. Here, we're going to give you a little bit of chump chains so you'll vote for us. And yes, they keep you a slave by making you think you're a victim. You know what your problem is? You don't have a brain. Somebody that's a born-again Christian that prays in tongues and reads their Bible, if you believe you're a victim, you don't have a brain. Look at your neighbor and say, if you think you're a victim, you don't have a brain. Come on louder one more time. Come on, find somebody else to say it to. And then they're in their people think they're entitled. You ought to give me something. My name is Jimmy. Give me, give me, give me. Give me some of that. Give me some of that. If you're always entitled, you don't have a brain. And so we got a brainless generational church voting for people they shouldn't vote for who promise I'm going to fight for you and make you more entitled. Let, let me tell you what they did in the Old Testament. They would take a man and they would castrate him. They would cut off the family jewels. He can't reproduce anymore. What did that do? It took away his dream of having his own. You're never going to have your own family, never going to have generations. And the reason they castrate them is to make their dream the eunuch's dream because he don't have the possibility of having a dream. Victimhood is spiritual castration. They've cut off your stuff. Entitlement thinking is castration. I know I'm in Minnesota, one of the most liberal places in America. You want to take an illegal alien and pay for his education when the people that are here are suffering. They want to cut off women's body parts and little boys' body parts. In the name of equity, you don't have a brain. If you're getting a body part cut off, I can for sure say you don't have a brain. How, how come you let them cut your breast off? Didn't have brain. And God says, let my people think. Moses said, let my people go. But it's 2024, I said, let my people think. Somebody say, let my people think. And to think, you got to have a Christian brain. To think like a Christian, you got to have a Christian brain. Now watch. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And it says, and Jesus increased in wisdom the Amplified says broad and full understanding and in stature and maturity and years in favor 
with God and man. In favor with God and man. When Jesus was born, he's like every other little baby. He didn't have a he didn't have a brain. It had to be built. That's why they read the Bible. That's why they quoted scriptures. That's why he watched his daddy, his stepdaddy watched his mother. He was building a brain. You don't just get a brain by reading. You get a brain by living in the context of life. Jesus had to grow a brain. How many want to be like Jesus and grow a brain? Come on, say, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Grow a Christian brain in me. Now, why is this so important? We got to have a brain that can think with the Holy Spirit. How can you flow unless you can think with the Holy Ghost? But it's something that's not, Prophet Kevin, will you lay hands on me so I can flow with the Holy Ghost? Are you going to read your Bible? No, your anointing is sufficient. I, I, I prayed in tongues. You know what the Bible says about tongues? It says when you pray in tongues, your mind is unfruitful. I'm, I pray in tongues a lot. But there's no substitute for a brain. Say praying in tongues is no substitute for a brain. Now, I'm going to give you a prophetic picture where this message is going. The Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 19. John 5, 19. We're going to read down to verse 20. Then Jesus appeared and said to them, he answered them and said, Most assuredly I say unto you, the Son can do nothing. Somebody say, Nothing. Come on, say nothing. nothing. But what I see the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Jesus had to see in his imagination because God gave him a brain. God gave him a ministry brain. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. And look at verse 30. A reading from the Amplified Version. I am able to do nothing for myself independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God as I get his orders. Can you be taught without a brain? You got to have a brain. He had, Jesus had to have a Christian brain, a kingdom brain. Even as I hear, I judge, I decide as I am bidden to decide. Can you make a decision without a brain? You must have a brain. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision, and my judgment is right. Because I do not seek or consult my own will, I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. Now listen to me very carefully. God is serious about this brain thing. And here's the good news. It's not too late to start growing one. It's not too late to start building one. You can use that next 10 years of your life. Some of you young people, you can shake the world if you get a Christian brain. And if you just go, God, I want to do great things for you. I want to do great things for you. Get a brain. God, I want to be, I want to be touched. I want to touch my generation. Get a brain. Get a brain. Why? Get a brain that God can guide. You got to recognize God's guidance. Everybody say, learning happens in your head. Thinking happens in your head. Now, this is why you got to have a brain. There's a kingdom brain. Your brain is a giant calculator. When you get stuff that comes to your brain, you see stuff, you hear stuff, your brain decides if it's worthless information, if you keep it, if you throw it away, if it adds to something that you know. Your eyes and your ears are just gathering information for your brain to process. I'm convinced that many Christians have died prematurely because they did not have a Christian brain. 
God tried to guide them. He tried to stop them. He tried to say, don't go there. Don't be with them. And because they did not have a Christian brain, they could not detect and discern. The word discernment means to decide between. You cannot separate your spirit and your mind or your brain. God uses it as a unit. Well, I feel led in my spirit. Yeah, but your brain has something to do with it. That's why the Bible says meditate, pray, seek, ask, knock. You got to have a brain. So your thinking is a calculation process. You interpret the world around you through your brain. And if you have a Christian brain, you get a Christian interpretation or a kingdom interpretation about the world around you. Now, here's how your brain works. When you get a Christian brain, so you, you process new information and you compare it to the old information. And many times, listen to me very carefully, without a Christian visitation to get a new brain, when God does a new thing, you'll treat it like junk mail. The Bible says people like the old wine better than the new wine because they never upgraded their brain. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time for a brain upgrade. <laughs> Come on, say, it's time for a brain upgrade. You see what you're prepared to see. I'll ask many times, I'll ask, I'll, I'll ask the minister, pastor, whatever, and I'll say, what's the last book you read that you liked? And they go, wow. I said, did you read a book this year? Well, did you read a book last year? Uh, you haven't read a book for five years. You're still operating on a five-year-old brain from the last five years. No wonder you can't see the new. No wonder you can't hear the new. Let me just say this. You guys just purchased this building. This, this used to be a Methodist church building, and it's, it's bigger than you need right now. But if God gave you the building... There must be a plan to fill it. But the plan has to come through your brain. God, I need a Christian brain so I can process your plan to fill this building. Can I tell you that most churches, most pastors that are over 40 are trying to build a church to be a success in the last century. Man, we're in a new day. We got to build a church for the future. We got to build a church for the problems of this generation that we don't even know about yet. I got to get a mind. I got to get the mind of Christ to build a church for the next 20 years. Because if I don't, the people will just walk right past it. I'll be invisible. I was talking to your pastor and Pastor Brian about getting some innovation ideas to reach this generation. We were talking about who they're called to. I see it so clearly. Let me just say this. If you will go after the people that are young, God will bring you money from afar. I was in a Church in Brazil, I had a guy that my interpreter got me in a church. And it was a church that had been going on for probably 20 years, this large church, probably 2,000 people. And he said, you know what? The pastor's son has started a church, and we're going to go preach there before we go to the big church. I said, where's it at? He said, it's in a mall. It's in a mall. So we went to this mall, went up an escalator, and they had rented a portion of the, the space there in the mall, and they had a church there. It had about 300 young people. They were yelling and jumping. You could feel the power of God. And he says, that, now, Kevin, we got to be gone out of here in an hour and a half because we got to go to the big church. So the Spirit of God began to fall. People get, began to get the Holy Ghost. Begin. And so he said, Kevin, we got to go. I says, I ain't leaving. I said, there's more destiny here than in the big church. 
there's more destiny with all these young people. Yeah, they don't have the money that this place has, but they're the young David. You know, years ago, I went to a, a church, and it was horrible, terrible, bad singing. Leadership had no character. Horrible. People unreceptive. But I knew I was sent there. And I said, Lord, what am I doing here? He said, I did not bring you here for the church. I brought you here for one young David. Samuel went to a picnic. He ignored all the old sons, and he found the 14-year-old teenager because destiny was upon him. This place is called to the young Davids. I was watching. Now, you're 60 years old, but you, you party like you're like 30 when you sing. You're jumping around, and your song got a little hip-hop to it. And hey, hey, you got a little rap thing going on there. I'm saying the people his age that don't have a vision, this is not their music. They want to hear some Bill Gaither. They want to recycle a bunch of Andre Croucher songs from 45 years ago. Oh, the blood, the G. Hey, I was at a church one time. And they kept singing songs from the 90s. I'm talking about like two years ago. I just got vexed. I said, could you please sing something from this century? <laughs> so I can tell you by the music, there's a call for young people. Your name is Joshua. I said, your name is Joshua. You're called to lead the Joshua generation, a generation who've never been circumcised, who've called to take their nation. Your name is Joshua, pastor. Your name is Joshua, Brian. And if you could take these young people and build a brain in them, God to pay your bills. If you could take these young people and build a brain in them, God to bring money from afar. Because most of these people, they want to go to hospice church. Just keep me comfortable till I fly away. Keep me comfortable till the Lord. And they're more concerned about the second coming than the first coming. Well, Kevin, what do you think about the second coming? Not much. Why? I'm still working on the first coming. Cast out devils, prophesy, build churches, win the lost. <laughs> the reason you're so preoccupied with the second coming is because you gave up on the first coming. Because you don't have a kingdom brain. He's here, guys. <laughs> this is prophetic preaching. You're a remnant church, sir. You're a remnant church. I said you're a remnant church. God is saying, build me a church with Christian brains that I can guide. Build me a church that I can speak and they can have something in them that can bring to their remembrance. Let me give a prophetic word I felt I got this afternoon. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. I'm going to read it in two versions. Paul was talking, he says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. So they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and search for him 
and find him though he is not far from each one of us. Why, why would God say this? Now listen to me very carefully. If this is where you are living and this is where God put you and this is where you were born, rather than go someplace else, now I'm not saying God won't lead you someplace else. He may do that. But if you feel no leading to go anyplace else, then this is your pre-appointed time. This is the time that God made for you to be here. And the Bible says if you search for him, you'll find the miracle, the doorway, the breakthrough, the money, if he puts you in this place. Your pre-appointed time. That means God put your blessing, your miracle here. That means God put your wife or your husband here. That means God has got to do something here. Somebody scream, it can happen here. Can happen here. Say, it can, happen here. it can happen here. Now, this is why God needs you to have a brain. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. I saw the Spirit of God making divine overcomers of the people coming to this church. Not some mystical thing, but systematic teaching that's going to build a kingdom brain. They got to have a brain pastor. They got to have the mind of Christ to follow Christ. If you have a phone, you can turn that off. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. And then God said in creation, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let us have, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created them in his own image. In the image of God, he created man, male and female, he made them. Then God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now listen to me. Most Christians that read this have no idea. This is called the creation mandate. What is it called? Creation what is it called? It can be also called the, the dominion mandate. Say the dominion mandate. dominion mandate. What does it say? Something about fish and birds and rule over the earth. And what does that mean? Listen to me very carefully. Number one, every day that God made something, at the end of the day, what did he say? It is good. Is that right? But did he say it was complete? But he said it was good. This is the plan of God. God left the earth incomplete to partner and build with you. God left the earth incomplete to partner and build with you. Now, what's the next thing? How many of the Bible says Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is heaven a city? How many read your Bibles? Is heaven a city? It talks about the gates of the city. It talks about the buildings and your mansions in the city. Somebody say, it started in the garden, it started in the garden but it ends in a city. It started in the garden, but it ends in the city. Now, why am I saying this? When Adam and Eve got their assignment, it was a garden. And he says, take all these raw materials and the brain I'm going to build in you and you're going to turn this garden into a city. Well, how do you rule over the fish? Build a boat, create nets, and go fishing. How do you rule over the, the birds of the air? Get a gun and shoot them down and cook them for dinner. How do you rule over the river, build a dam, and have electricity. He says, I put everything you're going to need in creation, 
But if you will get with, see, most people, they don't think that way. Well, I'm poor, Kevin. I was born black, and I was born brown, and I was born poor white, and I was born Hispanic, and my parents were illegal. Okay. But now you're a Christian. Now you're, you know, you're a new race of people. I was at a black church. I mean, everybody's black except like two people. I said, are you black Christians or Christians who happen to be black? Are you black Christians? Do you see the kingdom through color? Or are you Christians that just happen to be black? You can say the same thing in a white church or a brown church, Chinese church. Are you Chinese Christians or Christians who just happen to be Chinese? Now, why is that important? That creation mandate is in this building today. You're in the garden of God. You're in a city that God says, if you let me build a brain inside of you, you'll begin to develop and discover. You'll begin to invent. You'll begin to connect the pieces. I can make all of you wealthy, but I got to build a brain in you. Do you know why the Jews are so wealthy? Not all of them. There's some lame Jews. Some... But, but why, are, why is there a disproportionate amount of Jews that are wealthy? There's only like 16 million Jews on the earth. There's not that many Jews. We just have a, outside of Israel, we got the largest amount of Jews on the planet in the Americas. Why? Do you know what the Jews stress more than anything else to their children? Education. Build a brain. You know why? Listen to me. The Jews are persecuted everywhere. We see it right now. They took their homes. Look at what Germany did. They took their homes, took their possessions, took their jewels, took their businesses. But the most portable thing that the Jews have is their education in their brain. If I can make it to another nation with this brain in 10 years, I'll be blessed, I'll be wealthy. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Is it because they're Jews or is it because they have education and they let a brain be built and they're not even Christians? But they follow the principle of, okay, we're gonna get some education. So how much more will God bless you if you get the same education and the Holy Ghost? My God, you could, you could turn your world upside down. But you'll never do it if you got a victim mentality. You'll never do it if you got an entitlement mentality. You know how come there was so much rioting in Minneapolis in 2020? This state... And these universities have been pumping to this populace that you're a victim. It has been pumping that you're entitled. If you take those two together, I'm a victim, but I'm entitled. It always equals rebellion. I'll take it. Lawlessness. That's why they burnt down the police station. That's why they set everything on fire. And don't think it's over. Don't think it's over because the same victim mentality, the same entitlement, the same rebellious spirit, all they need is a spark to do it again. Now, why am I saying this? you got to get every bit of victimhood out of you. Somebody say, I'm not a victim. Matter of fact, let me have four black girls. Can I, can I, are you black? Kind of black. I'll take your, your pecan tan, mahogany. I'll take all of you. Come up here. <laughs> Just take, come on, stand right here. Take this microphone and say, I'm a black woman, but I'm a Holy Ghost woman, and I'm not a victim. Wait, can you <laughs> Say, I'm a black woman. I'm a black woman. I'm a black woman. But I'm not a victim. But I'm not a victim. I got the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. And God's going to build a brain in me. And God's going to build a brain in me. Sorry. I 
<laughs> when you get your brain, it'll sound better. Come on. <laughs> Say, I'm a black woman. I'm a black woman. But I'm not a victim. But I'm not a victim. More growl. But I'm not a victim. But I'm not a victim. No more time. I'm a black woman, not a victim. Come on. I'm a black woman, but not a victim. I'm a black woman, but I'm not entitled. I'm a black woman, but I'm not entitled. I trust in the Lord. I trust in the Lord. I trust in my king. I trust in my king. God build a kingdom brain in me. God build a kingdom brain in me. Say it again. God build a kingdom brain in me. Say it again. God build a kingdom brain in me. God build a kingdom brain in me. God build a kingdom brain in me. Come on. See, I'm a black woman, but I'm not a victim. I'm a black woman, but I'm not a victim. I'm a black woman, but I'm not entitled. I'm a black woman, but I'm not entitled. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm free. I'm free. God's going to build a kingdom brain in me. God's going to build a kingdom brain in me. Begin to scream, God, I want a kingdom brain. God, I want a kingdom brain. Don't say it. God, I want a kingdom brain. Come on, girl. God, I want a kingdom brain. Come on, girl. God, I want a kingdom brain. Come on. <laughs> it's coming on you right now. Come on. Come on, say, I'm a black woman. I'm a black woman. But I'm not a victim. But I'm not a victim. I'm a black woman. I'm a black woman. But I'm not entitled. But I'm not entitled. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Build a kingdom brain in me. Build a kingdom brain in me. Say it again. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Build a kingdom brain in me. Build a kingdom brain in me. Come on, say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Build a kingdom brain in me. Build a kingdom brain in me. We got to break that demon in this area. You can be seated. Well, Kevin, why did you just make them black girls? You embarrass them. If they're embarrassed, they need a new brain. I made them make a declaration as a black woman of God. They just happen to be black. And I will not let their skin color kill their chances in the kingdom. I'm not going to let your skin color make you a second-class Christian. I'm not going to let your gender make you a second-class Christian. He's here, guys. God left the world incomplete so that we could partner with him. Let me give an example. The first thing that Adam did... God gave him a job. He woke up from his dirt nap. I'm alive. Where am I? I didn't exist before five minutes ago. <sighs> but because he had the breath of God and the brain of God, because he had, Adam had the breath of God and the brain of God. Somebody say, Adam had the breath of God and the brain of God. And God said, Adam, take your brain over here and name all the animals. Now, why is that important? It shows you God didn't call the animals a different name than Adam named them. God called the animals the same name as Adam named them. He's in partnership. God's going to tell you to name some stuff. Woo! God's going to tell you to build some stuff. God has left the earth incomplete to partner with his sons and daughters. Adam had to have a brain to name the animals. He had to have a kingdom brain. So he said, Adam, I'm giving you the authority to take my creation and develop it and cultivate it. And even though there are people that are not Christians, that creation mandate is in humanity. We took a little bit of sand and made a silicone chip. We dug in the earth and got copper and made electrical wires. Is anybody hearing me? 
And so if you begin to say, Lord, what you have called me to build me a brain for it. Let me just say this. God cannot bless laziness. I've seen so many lazy Christians. Did you finish college? Did you, did you feel like you were going to go to college? Yeah, but I didn't. Uh, I went two, yeah, two and a half years. Why didn't you finish? I don't know. You know why? You didn't have a brain. You didn't have vision. Well, I was going to go to trade school to become an electrician or a tradesman or a welder. Why didn't you go? Well, and God is saying, you got to have a brain. You got to have a skill for me to bless. God cannot bless nothing. You got to have something to give to God. You give your God your brain, your talent, and say, Lord, build a brain inside of me and then bless it. You know, the Bible says this He will bless the work of your hands. And for this scripture, He will bless the work of your brain. Let me show it to you real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7 down to verse 9. This is the promise when they were in the desert. This is the promise when they were still in captivity, the sons and daughters of slaves. What did he say? For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Somebody say a good land. Say Minnesota is my good land. Minnesota is my good land. But Kevin, you don't understand how bad it is here. Well, then you have an opportunity because they got so many dummies here. Everybody here can be a leader. Look at your neighbor and say, you can, and you too can be a leader. Come on, say, and you too can be a leader. You, it's very simple to be a leader. You know how you do it? Just find somebody dumber than you. Very easy to be a leader. Just find somebody dumber than you. I know more than you. Now you're laughing, but that's exactly how God promotes you. He makes you the head of something. For the Lord is bringing you to a good land of brooks of water, fountains, springs that flow out of the valleys and the hills, a land of, that can grow wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, and then you will lack nothing, a land, and watch this, a land whose stones are iron, out of whose hills you can dig copper. So what God is saying is that I'm going to give you the ability to take what's all around you. I'm going to give you a brain to take advantage of it. You know what the word blessing means? To have the advantage. Isn't that beautiful? No matter what you are, what you are where you are, what you're doing, God says, if you will come to me, I'll give you a brain that can have the advantage. Come on, somebody say, God, build a brain in me that can have the blessing and have the advantage. So God is saying, cultivate the earth. Cultivate the earth. You know, I read a survey that 25% of, of a nation usually has its resources in the ground, oil, magnesium, steel, something. You got to go dig it up. It's in the ground. Another 15% is in the infrastructure, the lights, the wires, the roads. But 60% of the wealth of any nation is in the people, the human resources. And any nation that only looks to what's in the ground and not in their people, they are poor. There is no reason for any person in Minnesota with a halfway good brain to be poor unless you think I'm entitled. 
I'm a victim. That's fatalism. This is your good land. Teenagers, this is your good land. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to go to school because Jesus might come, and, and, and I'll be. I'll waste all that time in school. I'll be. In, I'll be. A, I'll be graduating. All of a sudden, I hear the trumpet. Da -da! I wasted all my education. <laughs> Can I tell you something? People say, "Well, Jesus is coming back soon." He's been coming back soon for 2,000 years. Does that mean he's not coming back? I didn't say that. But soon for God and soon for you is different. I was in a church one time, and uh, I saw this old guy, and he came up to me. He's about 80 years old. He said, he said, prophet, when is Jesus coming back? I said, for you pretty soon. He's 80 years old. That's probably 30 years ago. As they say, he's in glory now. Jesus is coming back for the harvest and the bride. He's not coming back because of a war or an earthquake. He's coming back for a bride. He's coming back for a harvest. Italy just broke 1% evangelical. Portugal is 2% evangelical. I think France is about 6% evangelical. Forget about England. Almost all the growth of kingdom is immigrants. Don't worry about it. Go get an education. Get married. Have kids. Buy a house. Build a business. Well, Jesus is coming back soon. I've been hearing that for 50 years. The Underkraut song. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the king, and Andre's dead. He said, count the years as months, count the months as weeks, count the weeks as days. Doc, we got lots of time. Don't worry about the second coming. Worry about the first coming. Make disciples, build churches, build businesses, occupy till I come. That's a military term to say, take over the area. Win elections. We got so many Christians who don't vote. Well, you know, you know, I don't like politics. Listen, you know what they called, you know what they called people who didn't vote in uh, Greece? The word, the democracy came from Greece. And it was about all the people coming together to decide what they were going to do with the land. You know what they called a person who didn't want to be participating in politics? This is a Greek word. Look it up. Idiot. <laughs> Idiotos. That's what in Greek is. Idiotos. Oh, well, I don't want to vote. Idiotos. We live in a democracy. We can determine the destination of who governs our nation, who governs our state. Well, I'm private, Kevin. I'm going to go to heaven. You know. I don't know what to do. Listen, vote your morals. Vote the Bible. Don't vote something that's going to kill babies, mutilate children, tell men that they can play in women's sports. Well, Prophet Kevin, I'm not sure what I am. I think I'm a woman in a man's body. I think I'm a man in a woman's body. I got a prophetic word for you. Take a shower. <laughs> Look between your legs. Your plumbing is your prophecy. <laughs> Somebody say, my plumbing is my prophecy. 60% of the wealth of a nation is in its people. But if you don't get a brain, you don't educate your... Do you know that companies, when they want to bring a factory to an area of the country, the first thing they look at is the educational system in that region why I've got to have an educated workforce. Now, if you're going to put a chicken ranch, it doesn't make a difference because they can deal with uneducated people. But if you're going to build technology and car factories and all, you've got to have an educated population. So they look, where is their education so we can have an educated workforce? 
You know what education is about? Solving problems. Say, if you solve big problems, if you, solve big problems you, make big you make big money. You solve medium problems, you, solve medium problems, you, make, medium money. you make medium money. You solve small problems, you solve small problems. would you like fries with that? You make small money. You solve no problems. You make no money. And usually you are the problem. Now listen to me. God is saying, I want to build a kingdom brain in you. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I want to build a kingdom brain in you. I need you to get stirred up and not be apostolic. You know, apathetic. I don't know. Quit being fatalistic. Now listen to me. What a building you have here. What a build. You could have a move of God in this building. I see, I see young people. 15, 20, 25, 30. Hundreds of them raising their hands, jumping, bringing their friends here, writing songs, getting education. And they're coming back. Pastor, I got my degree in engineering, and I'm a Christian, so I'm a Christian engineer. God has given me a Christian engineer brain. Come on up here, son. We're going to lay hands on you and prophesy over you. God is saying, I've given you the earth. What are you going to do with it? Minnesota is your garden. Ask God, what kind of brain do you want to build in me for work? What kind of brain do you want to build in me so I can make money? Well, it's so long, it's going to be three years. Well, you can spend three years on TikTok or three years in nursing school. You can spend three years on Instagram. Why do you call it Instagram? Because if you post them, they don't think you're glam. That you take the picture down and put a more glamorous one on. Instagram. Now today, I've been funny, I've been pointed, I've been direct. But God is saying, I want to do something here, but you got to have a brain. Your prophetic promise needs a brain. When I prophesy over people, the Lord wants to do this. He wants to do that. I'm thinking of a young teenager right now. His name is Alex Morgan. And I said, you're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to have this. You're going to... And he is 16 years old, working in a church at Tech. And he is, I heard raving reviews about him from the leaders. He's only 16 years old, but he says, this kid's changing our ministry. He's creating, a, he's creating solutions for, for things that we need. He's only 16, but he made a decision. I'm going to have a tech brain. I'm going to go online. If nobody will teach me, I'll teach myself. I'm going to figure this thing out. Today, God is saying, cry out for a brain. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your soul. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. And this is a big deal with God. Because the way he made the earth to function, you've got to have a brain. You've got to have something in that brain that can recognize and serve and, and perform a service. Jesus had a carpenter brain. And some people say it was a, a stonemason brain. But whether it was stonemason or carpenter, he had a trade brain where he could put pieces together and take raw material and turn it into something beautiful and majestic. And some of you today, especially you young people, God's going to visit you about this brain thing. 